All right, guys, welcome to the It's More Than Just Money movement channel. And as usual, it's a Monday. We are sitting at the winner's circle with Mr. Alon Reyes. If you don't know who he is, you probably know the company Reyes Corp uh, that works with incubating entrepreneurs. As I was talking to him a few minutes ago, he told me that he's incubated and helped over 15,000 companies. Mr. Reyes Corp himself, how are you? Oh, um, great. Great to be with you. I was just telling you that it's, a, it's actually an honor for me to be sitting here with you and having this conversation, uh, particularly because I know the work that you've done uh, to help uplift entrepreneurs in South Africa. You know, a lot of people are mostly focused on the glory, but I, I always say I want to know what the story is, you know, what the real story behind, uh, behind your work and behind you actually is and where the passion comes from you know and i'm sure there's a viewer sitting somewhere thinking what's this guy's story yeah well thank thanks for having me on your your show um my, my story goes back to my childhood where i was groomed to take over a family business and for for reasons i won't get into um I landed up not going that path. I was going, started that path, and then I walked away from that path. And um, I always tell, I have to, it's, there's two parts to the, the next uh, piece, which is that I landed up sleeping on the streets in Durban, but it wasn't because of drugs. I have to add part two in there. <laughs> but uh, if, was it because you didn't take up the route to run the family business? It was a result of, of that, yeah. So I landed up with absolutely nothing. And then I landed up working for, I uh, got a friend of mine who saw, where he saw my potential and uh, he got me to work in his uh, retail clothing store. And I helped to turn that business around. It, was, it wasn't doing well at the time I got there. Uh, I was 23 at the time and um, I got into the newspaper and on, in the daily news on page four. And um, I got a call at about 10 o'clock in the morning, and a man said, I've just read the article with an American accent, and he said, uh, um, I'm sending my driver to pick you up. Sending my driver to pick you <clears> up? <throat> yeah. To make it worse, it was a, a black BMW with tinted windows. It arrived. I walked outside the shop. I looked inside the, the, uh, the car. It was a small guy, so I thought, no, I'll, I'll be okay. You defend yourself. I can defend myself. <laughs> He, he takes me off to this um, uh, Smith Street at the time to uh, in Durban. In Durban, yeah. And uh, I go up to uh, a, a officer's big boardroom, uh, sitting there, and I meet this this man. And he asks me all sorts of questions, and I'm young, I'm nervous, um, you know. And eventually, he says, um, "How much do you earn?" Right. So I said to him, "I earn." Um, Three and a half thousand rand net. And so I thought, net, you know, I knew about tax. And so I said, I'll tell you what, I'll pay you three and a half thousand rand. You sit on the beach, come up with any business you like, and I'll back you. So he's giving, he's offering you a salary to start a business. Yes. Three and a half thousand, and you just need to come and I'll back you. And I said, no, there's something wrong here. So I said, thank you, sir. And I went back to the shop and my, my, Friend said, what was that? And I said, some crazy guy. I didn't believe it. <laughs> About two weeks later, the same man phones me back and says, what are you still doing there? Um, and so I realized it was true and I started a journey and um, to now come up with a business. Now, what business do you get into? Like somebody says, get into a business. Any business. Any business. I'll back you. Turns out this guy's a dollar billionaire. And not a Zim dollar, a US dollar, but then <laughs> okay. and, yeah. uh, and, um, and, and what year is this? This is uh, early nineties. The early nineties. Yeah. It was already a dollar billionaire. Yeah. And, um, anyway, so I, I started a business called the New York Sausage Factory, which was, um, a f I, I'd come up with this idea around hot dogs and I won't go into how I got to that. Mm -hmm. But um, I started in Pine Town. I started my first store in Pine Town, just outside of Durban, and it was a complete failure. And I, I couldn't get this business to work. And I, 
open up for the breakfast trade, I opened an evening trade, I worked seven days a week, I, I, I stopped eating. I, I actually, one day when I was driving home at about 11 o'clock at night, I passed out while I was driving because I hadn't been eating and anyway. Um, Working seven days seven a week. Uh, because I refused to, to fail. I didn't want to fail. Mm. And um, eventually I had to come to the conclusion I'd failed. And you know, if you think about it, now think about that situation. I had every single opportunity. I had, I had a private education. Yeah, I didn't, you know, so I'm a privileged white kid. I've got a backer. Many okay. white people don't yeah. see that. Okay. Okay. Um, I've got a backer. Yeah. Okay. He's going to back me. A billionaire uh, for a billionaire. that matter. Yeah. Yeah. I've got, like, in, he didn't say you must go into this. So how do you now, you can't, you can't, bl what can you blame? Right. Okay. Can you, you can't blame anything. Can't blame education. You can't blame education. You can't blame anything. So I had to then in that, mo in that sort of, struggle to come to that it was me that failed so that was a very very hard like to to get to that place as a young and i don't know if you remember in your 20s you're quite arrogant you're going to take over the world yeah and i'm going to be a billionaire by 25 five. exactly <laughs> exactly exactly so you go through that journey and then i eventually went to see him uh at his apartment and uh, i said to him you know, I failed, and quite very dramatically, if I, if I spend the rest of my life, I'll pay you back. And I started walking to the, uh, to the lift, to the elevator. He, you know, obviously, he had a private elevator, and he was in the penthouse. So he, he, he shouts out. He says, sit down. There's this deep voice, sit down. <clears throat> Crap myself. I sat down. He says, um, did I back you? Or did I back the business? I sure. said, you backed, you backed me. So he says, right now, the business has failed. If you walk out that door, you have failed. Okay. And that was such an instructive moment in my life. He said, if you had to do it again, what would you do differently? And then I said to him, I changed the menu, I changed the venue, I changed the pricing. I told him everything I would do. So he says to me, okay, I'm going to back you again, but I'm not giving you money. I'm going to give you people. I'm going to give you, there was a guy who was always on my case. I called him Negative Ned. He was an accountant. He was, he, he was always like on me. On you. On me. So he says, he's going to be your finance person. He owned an ad agency in Durban. He says, the CEO is going to become your marketing guy. And he put a team of people around me. He says, so I said, well, how am I going to open up the next door? He says, that's your problem. I'll back you by giving you the people. And so with this team of people around me, with five people around me, I worked with them. So you had a finance guy, marketing? I had a, a let's call it a strategy guy. And uh -huh. I, yeah, he gave me someone to help me with admin. You could just put a team of people around me. There were five people around me. And... With, with those people. No, I want to know those people. Strategy, yeah. finance, marketing, sales, and, and admin. Sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah right. So, so that, that, um, that team, um, then I worked with them, and we opened up our second store at the Pavilion Shopping Center in, in Westville, a 52 square meter little store. Mm. And that business, that shop took off. So fast forward to many years later, because after that, I left that, sold that business. I got into vehicle security. I was in that for seven years. Um, I then decided to leave that. Um, I'd moved up to Johannesburg and um, uh, I met my potential wife. And three months before I was about to get married, I resigned from, from that business. Um, and I decided... Uh, and in my shareholders' agreement, it prevented me from selling for two years. Sure. So, and I couldn't go into a, com a competitive. I wasn't going to. But while I was at the vehicle security space, I was the marketing director there. I had a little ad agency. And every, I, you become intimate with your suppliers. And every single month, they would come to me and say, could you pay me early? 
just a little bit early. So what's going on? What's going on? I think, can you please pass early? Cash flow issues. Sure. So I said, let me help you turn around your business. So I worked with them on um, Saturdays on, in the evenings. And one day they invited me on a Saturday to a wimpy. And then these two guys reached over and I said, welcome, partner. I said, what do you mean? They said, the business turned around and we're giving you equity in the business. So how much? 33%. So when I had moved up to Joburg with that vehicle security business, the, uh, a lady phones me up. She goes, I hear you turn around advertising agency. So yeah. I said, yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> so she goes, how does it work? I said, come see me. So she came to see me. And so I said, oh, if I turn you around, I get 33%. Because I just, there was no yeah. model. You've got a working model. Yeah, yeah. you've got a working model. <laughs> This is all BS, you know? Yeah. So I worked with her. And then when I resigned, I went to the two of them and I said, I'll work with you full time. And you take care of a quarter of my salary each. And I'll take care of, I'll work out the other half and I'll get that through, through profit share. So I'll work with you and really grow your businesses. So I then started with those two. And then it went to three, to four, to five, to six, to seven. And then when we were seven, I was driving around Johannesburg. I had a broken car that, you know, AC, the summer, windows wouldn't come down, doors wouldn't lock. So no, there has to be a better way. Mm. And so I called them all to a meeting, all seven. I said, let's move into one place. And then I can move from one office to the next. Instead of them to be the, the yeah, same yeah. office park. Same, yeah, same office, same set of offices. And I said, we'll share reception, share a boardroom. And that's how we started what was to become Race Corp. And two years into it, I was at a, a braai and somebody says, what do you do? And I explained to them, I said, oh, you run an incubator. I'd never heard the term. Never heard it. But I was already doing it. And then... And you were getting 33% uh, equity in all of them because of the first one. That you did and you were given equity. Yeah. Right. And then that is how Race Corp started. And then many years later, five years and two months later, I made profit. I didn't make profit for five years and two months. I borrowed money, I borrowed money, I borrowed money from brothers in law. From Was it to reinvest in the businesses? Or? I had five credit cards. I didn't even know it was illegal. And I can say it now, but honestly, I didn't know it was illegal. It's called cut flying. I, would borrow, I had five, opened up five credit cards and moved money between them to keep to cash flow me out. I had five friends who I borrowed money from and I just kept the money rolling. That's how cash flowed race corp. And so five years and two months it's later. Illegal, guys. It's illegal, guys. It's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Five years, two months later, I made my first profit and then I went to my mentor and I gave him equity in the business. A billionaire mentor. Yeah. And he said, he took it and then when we started to make real money, he wanted to give it back and I said, no, a deal's a deal. And that's the, that, so what Race Corp is, is a paid forward for what happened to me because what we do, that guy gave me a second chance, mm. right? What we do is give people a second chance because even uh, while I'm telling that story, we're, we're, even with all, everything I had, I failed and have since failed, just by the way, many times in many things. So to be in an environment where you've got people who believe in you, people who can give you the support, people, people that can push you through, that's far more important than knowing that sales is cost of sales is GP. Mm -hmm. You know, the technical side is one thing you can watch you. But being in a supportive environment for entrepreneurs is far more critical than anything else. Why do you think uh, the, the billionaire chose to back you in the first place? I tell have, you, ever, have you ever had that conversation? Yeah, you? I did. I did. Um, I'm still, he's still my mentor today. He doesn't live in South Africa anymore, but he was here a couple of weeks ago. He came for dinner. You know, he's, he's, I've got grown kids now. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I asked him. I and asked he's still him, a billionaire? Multi, multi. Multi-billionaire. Yeah. Now. Okay. But I asked him at that time, because we know, yeah, uh, what is it that you want? Like, what do you see? And I, I knew, I thought many more uh, better entrepreneurs than I, I believed I was. And still, but he saw drive. He saw persistence. He saw what he saw. Actually, I'll tell you what he saw. 
He saw father issues. Okay, father issues. So he became, he had father issues. Uh -huh. And there's two psychologists, Collins and Moore, that show that if you've got father issues, you're far more likely to become a successful entrepreneur than if you don't. Doesn't mean, now I'm I've, a, I've got father issues, guys. <laughs> True story. True story. But, yeah. Right? So, I mean, I'll, I'll, we can talk about the psychology of that later, but and now I've got two boys. Now, do I, I'm, do I act as a bastard to them? No, because... Probably like, not. No. So, you know, it's in a dilemma. So it doesn't mean that if you've got a good relationship with your father, you won't become successful. It's just a probability curve. But father issues is a very high predictor of success. Very high predictor. So I had father issues. Yeah. He had father issues. And if you look at who he invested in, if, they, he's, if he identified father issues, that was a good investment uh, strategy for him. So not totally, but that was it. So even in my, I invest in a big a race corp. We've got a division called Partner Elite where, where we, that's the original part of race corp with the equity. Uh -huh. um, and there, if they got, I asked, what's your relationship with, like with your father? <laughs> okay. If you've got father issues, you come to the front of the queue, you know, you come straight to the front and we can have a conversation because I, I understand the drive in so, not yet, that cockroach that run, runs around your head when you've got father issues. Hmm. So that's the main reason why he personally did it, but he didn't know that when he read your story, did he? No, no, he knew that because when he was asking me questions. Oh, he, he was, was having the conversation yeah. with you now to, yeah. to check where the drive comes from Look, or what? Yeah, where the drive, I think it was more than that, but, but that was definitely yeah, part of the story, I believe. I don't know it to be true. He didn't say that. You know, his answer was, you were driven. You were hungry. You didn't, wanna, you didn't want to lose. But he has yeah. another thing, yeah. which I learned from him since. Well, he didn't say it then. Deservedness. I deserve success. Deservedness. When you, it's not entitled. There's a difference between entitled and deservedness. Uh -huh. When you are when you inside, I deserve it. I'm not entitled to it. I deserve it. So, very important line between the two. That is a high predictor of success. Can you differentiate between the two? I'm not entitled, but I deserve it. it deserve is you can link the reason to something you've done, do your character, something, I work hard, I do these things, I put in the hours, I do all those things, I deserve it. Entitled, it's because of something external. That has nothing to do with it you. Did, I, I had nothing. There was no connection to me. So if That's I make it. this connection, your success so that you've I, worked I for. I grew up poor. I, I, I deserve to be rich. That's not, that's entitled. That's not deservedness. I yeah. work hard and I'm poor. Yeah. Okay. I deserve. It's, there's a subtle but important difference in the psychology of the two. So I'm, I'm tempted to bring it back to you and say, you were groomed to run the family business. Mm. You were entitled to it. And, and, but then you didn't do it. You went ahead to work hard. Then you deserve the success you've built for yourself. Here, here's the, here's the, the truth, is that if I, if I pers pursued the family business, uh. I would be my father's son. So it would have, do you understand that, that, that yeah. I would have Acceptance. Been, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that my reference point would be his so-and-so's son. Oh, that would become your identity. That's my identity. Yes. Yeah. yes. Where if I do it now, Alon Rez is my identity. I'm not somebody's son. Well, I am, but that's not my identity. I'm not, I don't get my, who are my, my internal strength or my, my purpose, anything from external. It's me. So. Did you know that at that point though? I knew that at that point. Something happened. How did you know that? I, I had an incident, which I seldom talk about, where I want to go into the detail, where I witnessed a 40-year-old man re being referenced as somebody's son, not as by his name. 
Hmm. And when and I you were that, younger at the time. That was a week before I, 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 I made my decision. Was that the turning point? That, that was the turning. I watched that, and I saw myself. I saw that. That's good. I was remember I was early twenties. Yes. Right? So I'm now looking at that and going, "That's me." And you know, when you're twenty three, and somebody's forty, they're old. You know, a forty year old's very old when you're twenty three. Yeah, they look they're, very old. Was, yeah. <laughs> right. So I just looked at this guy. He says he's forty, and he's still not his name. Is somebody's son. When I saw that, I thought, that's my future. I don't want that future. I'm prepared to go a different route. So basically you said, I'm prepared to suffer. That's what the, the different route was. To, to be me. To, for my success to be mine. You know, the reason I think that's powerful is because a lot of people don't think that you actually have to suffer to be you and be your own person and run your own your own stuff and have control. Mm. A lot of people would rather, here's, here's, here's the easy path. I'll enjoy the family wealth. It's okay. I am, I am his son anyway. Mm. So why didn't you choose that path? Although a lot of people in your position, including the man who was 40, mm -hmm. who was called so-and-so's son, he chose that path. Mm. Why, why was it not easy for you to just take that path? It was easy. I just didn't choose the easy path. I choose. I chose a different path, and I chose. Oh, so you knew your life would be easier if you chose that path. Oh, for sure, uh, much easier. But financially, and not 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 in terms of who I was, not in terms of my my personal sense of you know pride and 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 you know, if if everything this table, you know this cup, I've paid for, I've worked for. Does that have a lot to do with purpose and destiny? And what would you say around that purpose and destiny and how it drives one to, the, to become more of who they are? Yeah, I think purpose, you know, everyone talks about it. Mm. And, and I think it's, it's, um, it's far more important than people, because a lot of people say you have to have purpose, you know, or, or, or you have to be connected to your purpose because I'm, I've been in this for 23 years now. Yeah. Right? Um, I don't intend retiring. I think I'm going to literally die at my desk, right? Yeah. I'll just kill over and that, that's it. Um, because to me, I love what I do and I'm now in my 50s and you, if you ask me, I th I'm just getting started. I, you, you're I just feel, getting started. I just feel right now, okay, now I understand business. Now I've got it. Like in my fifties. Oh, okay. You feel like you're paying school fees when I'm paying, paying school fees. And and my purpose is how many more entrepreneurs can I empower before I die? That's 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 the purpose. How many more entrepreneurs can I create? How many more millionaires, more successful people can I precipitate, support? encourage how, how many more that's my purpose that's just my purpose it's not because i'm such a great guy it's mm -hmm. because that's you saw you heard my story i was given second a second chance that's that sits in inside me in the center but don't cry for me i'm not sitting here hugging trees and singing kumbaya yeah i make i make a profit i'm for profit i want to be financially successful i'm relatively successful um, I'm in the process of succeeding. I don't ever believe I'm successful. So that purpose sits at the core, the center of everything that I do. Mm -hmm. But more important is con that commitment to keep pushing because we know how many entrepreneurs give up to push through that pain, to hold at that place where you go in your head. And I, I'm sure you've been there been there many times many entrepreneurs who are watching this have been there where you just don't think you can go any more one more day doing this thing there's so much negative feedback mm -hmm. your bank balance is in the minus everyone's telling you to get a job so you need to be able to commit to your mission have you had you ever been tempted at the time um to leave it all and go back home many times Many times. Why, did, why didn't you? Uh, because 
I couldn't look at myself. In fact, the one time I, 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 I was so close. Like, I, I just remember it was just so close. You know, so close. What had happened then? No, there was, you know, people were, you know, our emissaries were being sent, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and we, this is your get, you'll get. And I was just in a very, very, very weak financial state. And um, my, my worst time was when I get my wife, uh, gave birth to my first bo- child and I couldn't afford, I had to go borrow money to get him out of hospital because I couldn't afford the hospital fees. And I had to go to my two brothers-in-law to borrow money from each mm. to, to get him out, which was very embarrassing. And then you think, now I'm not, re- I'm not responsible just for me and my ego because it's ego. At the, e- at the end of the day, mm. you push that down, it's your ego, right? Mm. I want to be the man. But now I'm responsible for this other life. Now you can say, well, is it worth, is my ego that important when I can't afford to literally take my kid out of hospital, never mind feed them uh, after that? So is it worth it? And something stopped me. And, and then eventually, you know, you push through and then there's one bit of good news and you work harder and, you, and it just starts to turn. And then at some point, it happens, and then you, I've never looked back. So, does rejection and being at a low point then drive some entrepreneurs, including you, to scale and grow their businesses or to push through those hard moments where they want to give up, but they're like, I don't want to face this, that embarrassment ever again. Yeah, yeah, that's the driver. So, in, in entrepreneurial um, academics, that's it's called knowing your negative psychological drivers your negative psychological, psychological drivers, drivers. okay yeah. so when you know that i don't want to be poor i don't like my father um, I gambled and lost the house you know those kinds of stories or my i grew up very very poor you do, if you don't want that that's called a negative psychological driver so can i add one guy says date the girl who's out of your league and then when she breaks your heart you're going to go work hard. Is that no. the same thing? I don't know if it's the same thing. Because <laughs> <laughs> it could be a negative psychological driver yeah, to it, say, it, I don't you ever want to find myself in a point and at a space where anyone is out of I'll my t- I'll tell you what would be in that story. If she said, you're not good enough. You that's don't, why I'm you don't have again. money. You don't have money. That's a negative psychological. Right. You never want to be in that situation again. So, so when you, when you have got, when they look at successful entrepreneurs, the ones who have, a strong relationship with their negative psychological drivers. When I say a strong relationship, a healthy one, not because it can also become uh, too obsessive. You need a, it needs to be a healthy relationship where you understand where, what role it plays. But you also have strong vision. So you need a, something to pull you and something to push you. You yeah. need both. And you need the, in the center, you need that purpose we spoke about before. Right. And now you're going to go through lots of bumps and a lot of, no, I, I'm talking about two years ago. that are chasing you that you feel. Two years ago. Yeah. I had a terrible, terrible six months in, in race school. There were things that were happening that I thought at this time, come on, these things shouldn't be happening. Not at this 23 time. years yeah, later. Not 23 years later. Shouldn't be happening. So, so. You know, and then you think, why? You know, and then you look at your friends who are working at uh, the banks and making lots of money and driving fancy cars. Think, the month end, their salary comes in. Yeah, they, well, they come home, they put their keys down, and it's switch off. I, I'm I'm generalizing. Sure. Well, I never switch off. I'm sure you don't switch off. No, there's no yeah. time to switch yeah. off. So, if there was a point in time where you would meet an entrepreneur who's at the end of the crossroad mm. and they wanted to give up, what advice would you give them? What are the things that you say? Because I'm sure you've met yeah. thousands of entrepreneurs that came to you and said, you know what? You've backed me. But just like you wanted to walk out the door, I'm, I'm walking out the door. I'm, I'm not looking back. You know, when I was in the vehicle security business, um, we were also, I had... Um, Forty staff there. We couldn't pay rent at one at one point, um, and our investors wouldn't put any more money. And this man um, took me to lunch 
I was just praying that he would pay because it was very important. And he asked me about the, the business and we were up against the, the wall. We had literally the creditors sitting in our reception waiting to be paid. We hadn't paid the rent for, for ages. We hadn't, you know, and it, I wouldn't be able to make 40 salaries at the end of the month. And he took me for lunch and I, in my head it was all over. And he kept asking me these questions about the technology we had. And I kept saying, it doesn't matter about that. It's all over. So he says, why do you say that? I said, I can't pay the staff. I can't pay my creditors. So he says, ah, that's cash flow issues. Tell me more about, he like, he went like that. He says, tell me more about the technology. Yeah. So I told him, he says, this is so exciting. Da, 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 da. And he got all excited about this. So I said, but you're missing out something. I'm, I can't even develop, further develop that because of where I am. So he says, all you need is another, in, uh, another investor. Start just calling our couple of other investors and and uh, and go and sell them this so that was on the tuesday on the wednesday i sent out a whole bunch of emails i got an appointment up in joburg remember i was in durban mm. i came up to joburg i met with um a company mm. and uh, and i pitched and they 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 valued at that time we were game over valued the business at 10 million rand and they gave us three million rand for thirty percent. Like on, on literally on the Monday, I thought it was all over. Tuesday, I go for lunch. Wednesday, I'm thinking, if, and and th Thursday afternoon, I've got three million rand that committed. Quick. That quick. So my point in that story was that what that man did was he kept asking different questions. So this, you asked me that what I would do and what I do now. Mm. My my thing is for as long as you can ask different questions, you carry on. For as long as you're getting different answers, you carry on. When you can stop, when you stop being able to ask different questions around your business, when you can't get different answers, that's the point to give up. And so, very what a big role that I do, even because even in, in my investments, the entrepreneurs get to points where they also psychologically are stuck or they're at a, a breaking point. And then I go to them and I say. Okay, what about this? Have you thought of this? This what ha would you, what would happen if that? What would happen if that? If you thought about it this way, what would happen? And then you can see their brains switch on again, and now the, and then they carry on. Mm. Okay, so that you need to be able to do that to yourself. You need to reframe your context again and again. So in your first, I would say relationship with failure, mm. right? First time around. Okay, the first time you failed. Um, you had all the backing, all the indicators were leading you towards success. And then you failed. And then the second time around when you were trying out, you didn't have the money, but you had resources in terms of the team that you had around you. What do you think was the difference between the two when you had the money and when you didn't have the money, but had the resources in terms of the people that were around you? Well, I had the resources. I, I had an, an, a support ecosystem, but a lot of people do. They just don't reach out to it. They're too proud or what, whatever the case may be, or they've got the wrong people in the ecosystem. They don't curate that ecosystem. Mm. So for me, my advice to, to entrepreneurs is ensure you cur curate your ecosystem to people who can support you, but more importantly, to reach out to those people and be vulnerable to those, those people. When you come with your bravado and you're, you know, you know I, I think that's the worst thing is when you, you, you come with this bravado, how the good things are, etc. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you another story with my mentor that, that happened, which talks to that. I'm now um, in, the, in the, I think I was in the, uh, the vehicle security business. I don't know which one I was with, with the mentor. I go to his house. I'm sitting in the house and we're sitting talking and he keeps looking at his watch. So I'm thinking, I'm getting the body language that, you know, he's, so eventually after the third or fourth time he's looked at his watch, I say, do you, do you need to go somewhere? So he goes, no, 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 we've got an hour. So I said, oh, no, it looks like you have to go somewhere. So he said, oh, because I'm looking at my watch. So I said, yeah. So he says to me, no, no. He said, you've been for 30 minutes, you've been telling me how great you are. For 30 minutes, you've been telling me how good it is. Do you want to get some value out of this meeting? 
or do you want to carry on the next 30 minutes telling me how great things are? Mm -hmm. I was 20 something when I, when he did, it was like punching me in the stomach, right? But that, that was another, another moment in my life where, where I, I realized that when you're going to be in front of a mentor, it's not about beating your chest and being saying how great things are. Okay. It's not like telling the world, like what your website looks like and it all looks great. You need to be vulnerable and talk about the warts and the, the, all the bad things that are happening. Otherwise, if you're not vulnerable around those things, you can't actually get the right kind of support. So some people in your ecos, your network, you can't trust with that kind of vulnerability, then they need to be removed. You need to put people around you that you can trust with that level of vulnerability. But I think the bigger work is for you to be vulnerable and say, I don't know what I'm doing. I, 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 I've tried this, I've tried this, I, I've come to my, to the end, and then listen. Mm. That takes a lot of honesty mm. that one needs to have with themselves. So, we, you obviously did not have it when you had that conversation with your mentor. Is it something that one can develop even before they get to the point where they are told that you need to be vulnerable? Yeah, I think, I think I was lucky in the sense that that moment happened for me. And if you look, I, I mentor six people a year, that's it, in, in directly, uh -huh. other than my partners. But in, in that, I always tell them, that come, if, you, if I'm going to mentor you, it's, it's, it's brutal. I'm brutal. I'm like that because I grew up with a, quite a brutal mentor. In other words, he was direct said it as it was. There was no, how are you doing? And let me make you feel good. It was very direct. And because I, I think I was relatively strong and to be able to handle it, I handled that. When he punched me, I took the punch. And then like it, there was a, like a, a short circuit in the brain. And then I, I had the common sense to turn it. You know, so, so I'm that guy now. I've become that brutal with, with my mentees. Uh, so some people can't handle it. And very often when a, a mentee comes and I go, this is what is going to happen. And then I do it. They don't come back because they can't they don't handle come back. They don't come back. They don't come back. So is it, is it maybe what we talked about having that relationship with pain? Because it's painful yeah. when somebody's going to tell you brutal facts. But the pain is to look at yourself. You have to look at you. I think the biggest battle for an entrepreneur is dealing with themselves, mm -hmm. dealing with who they are and their weaknesses, their own weaknesses, their own, like, you know, that whole thing for five years and two months, you're trying, you're trying, trying, and you're failing. Mm -hmm. Something's got to be telling you there's something. I mean, the feedback is there's something wrong with you. So you have to keep introspecting, what am I doing wrong? Me, yeah. not, not because of me. But how, how does that one separate? I mean, there's race corp, there's you. Remember when your mentor said to you, the business failed, but if you walk out of the door, now you failed because I didn't back the business, I backed you. Mm. Now if you're sitting alone and it's not working out, how do you separate and say, maybe it's the business that's failed and not me? No, I never believe that. Maybe it's me that failed even, and not the business. You, 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 know, you know, even now that he said that, I think... Because the business landed up not failing because I, 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 the, with the support. Do you then, think that something changed in you as well? Yeah, yeah. I, be, in that moment of coming to the point of I failed and then, ch and then pivoting your, your mindset and opening yourself to, to other people, it was the same business. The business didn't close down. You hear what I'm saying? That, sure. that branch had failed. I, I had to change. I, there had to be a different, you had to move from, you know, from a on a different operating system. But, but I see now, and I've got a, a, a friend who's in, in a business now that is just not doing well. And every time I talk to him, he, we go, what's the path? But he cannot take himself on a new path. Mm. And so... I don't foresee that business succeeding because he carries on on the same thing. That ability to then, for you to change, you, for you to open, change your, 
your methodology, be vulnerable, listen, be humble in, in, in with advice, but still be, because a lot of people will give you advice. If three people, you meet three people, give you three different piece of advice. You have to take from those three people what you, for a piece of each that works for you because the best person to synthesize their advice is you, mm. not, not them. But be open to bringing in that information into your calculations and then move. And, and that is much harder. It's easy to say, but it's much harder to actually do mm. because we have egos. And egos are actually the enemy of success, mm. in my opinion. And now does one separate from criticism versus advice you know sometimes some criticism comes in the form of advice yeah but when you listen to it it's actually criticism and vice versa uh, yeah, because yeah. i read some somewhere uh, yeah. the guy wrote do not take criticism from someone you do not take advice from i thought yeah what exactly that does that I, mean i think you, i think all all feedback positive or negative criticism positive negative is all feedback it's for, you to, it's for you to interpret because a criticism can be a pro provocation to you to go, is that true? Mm. Right? It's not true. Okay, no, no, it's not true. So it's a, it's a criticism. Uh, you, you're lazy. Okay. So you right. introspect after that. You do the introspection. You go, is that true? Am I lazy? Yes, I am. Then it's positive, right? It worked. Or it's, I'm not lazy. I work damn hard. Okay then I reject it. Or it's, um, okay, what I need to do about that? You know, it's about how do I take, use that? Mm. Okay. Um, or it might be, why does he perceive it that way? Or like, what am I doing for him to think that way? It's all the information which you use. If you just reject it, it it's like, ah, right. So you, you, it's not about the fact that you have to accept it, but you have to process it. And you can reject it after you process it, but it has to come in, process, and go out. It either changes you or it doesn't change you. Mm. Why do I have a feeling that um, that boils down to it's not even about the criticism or the advice or anything that happens to you that's external? It's mainly what your response is going to be or how you respond to that thing. Yeah, and the response is the processing prior to that because you have to, before you respond, mm -hmm. react is no thinking, respond is the thinking. So you're right, 100% it's about the response. Okay, and then there's something that you said that was quite interesting. Maybe I want to know more about that. Uh, when you said people that have had further issues mm. are, are prone to become successful, mm. or obviously not all of them, yeah. But the, there seems to be a drive about those people, especially when they get into business. Um, what's the psychological explanation of that? I just, I just don't the, understand. The, the theories. So the theories, I don't yeah. think anyone knows, but this is a theory. Okay. So in the animal kingdom, you've got the, the bull, okay. yeah, the alpha male. Then in all the young males will come and challenge the old male. He's physically stronger. He's more experienced. They come there, he bats them off. Okay. The next year, the same thing. The next year, the same thing. The next year, the same thing. Mm. Eventually, he gets older and he gets weaker. They become stronger and more experienced. And eventually, one of the bulls knocks the alpha male off the perch. Sure. Okay. And it is witnessed by the rest of the herd. All they see, okay, this dude took that dude out. Okay. And it's a witnessed environment. So his um, authority to be there is understood by everyone. He's proven himself. You saw that, right? He was there. I took him out. I'm, I'm the new uh, alpha male. Okay. And I'm, you could, this is not necessarily about males, but I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically. Sure. Right. When your father, is not available to you emotionally or physically, death, divorce, or whatever the case may be, okay, then you have no place to prove. There's no proof. So you spend your life trying to prove mm. your, your reason for being there. And I can tell you this right now, and you can tell it to me, and we can understand it. 
it's ingrained in you. It, it won't change you. It will not change you. The fact that you now understand the a theory on that psychology is not going to change you. You still have got this deep in your DNA need to prove. That is a that is a driver of no. That's a negative psychological driver, okay? And that drives you, and it tends to drive you far more at a deep psychological level than anything else because you keep needing to prove yourself. Yeah, at some deep level. So do I. That's uh, quite interesting because is it true for, you? for me, yes. Because even when I I went through my divorce, I I I said to my now ex wife that you can take anything you want to take but you're not taking my thought. Yeah. Because there, I feel like I need to prove to myself yeah. that I can raise an intelligent, strong girl that's going to do well one day. Yeah. Because I didn't have that. I didn't have a father that does that. Yeah. And then with business, it's more, I feel like my mother invested a lot in me because she was all alone. Mm -hmm. And then I, because I work hard, I deserve, I have to be successful. There's no other way. So whether it's a YouTube channel, uh, whether it's a property development, anything that I do, I want it to be successful. Not mm. for anyone else, but yeah, but mainly because I want to prove that I can. <laughs> you see, it's strong. And now that you know, tomorrow you're not going to stop, right? No, no, no. I, I, yeah. I, 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 I can't. But also, maybe, maybe also because I feel like, you know, remember earlier on when you talked about uh, the things that drive you? Uh, the things that push you to do certain things, the, the negative uh, psychological, psychological drivers, drivers, right? Yeah. And the things that you aspire to. For me, I even write about it in, a, in my book. There's something that you're constantly chasing and there's something that's constantly chasing you. Very yeah, right? It's the same thing in different words. Yes. So for me, I feel like because I come from the township and I was raised by a single parent, the stereotype around kids that are raised by a single parent. Mm. So, a whole part of me, an entire, my whole embodiment is to disprove that myth that I can be raised by a single parent, still be successful, still be a good father, mm. still do well in society. Yeah. So that's a strong push. Yeah. And understand because I come from the township there, poverty is chasing me yeah. where I come from because that's yeah. where I come from. Yeah. And then also I'm aspiring to a better life. Yeah. I want to sit around the table with the likes of you mm. and, and, it's okay for me to be there because I've worked for it. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, that's, that's yeah. how I can summarize. Yeah. I, lo I love something is chasing you and you're chasing something. I love that. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's the same for every young person that's out there. Mm. You know, there's a, there's a drive, there's a place where they want to be. You know, if you go back and say, let's say I'm sitting around the table with some guys and I'm like, no, when I did my interview with Alon, it's not just, an interview for me. A part of me says, for let's say Ronan to be able to say, call my friend, there must be a level of trust mm -hmm. he has in me that, okay, mm -hmm. he's not going to screw up the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, which means I worked for it. Yeah. So, it's quite a powerful thing. And I, I don't want to go deep into that. I want to go back to you because there's a lot of stuff that you are teaching. If you were in your 20s again, mm. what would you do differently? 20s, 30s? Oh, uh, you, you, you know, a lot of people say, I do not I do all the same again. Uh, I, I'm not that guy. Do you think they lie? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. They, they, they might not be lying, but if I say that, I'd be lying. <laughs> you, know, you know, the thing is, I wish I was more aggressive. Aggressive? Not, not, not physically aggressive. Okay. You know, if I look back at the many opportunities that have come in my, in my time, I, I didn't squeeze the juice out of that opportunity. I wasn't quick or and aggressive enough at that time. Mm. And you know, the, the, the thing that I'm trying to teach my kids is that these things that you, you see are not permanent. Nothing's permanent. So when an opportunity arrives, it's impermanent. If you dilly dally around that, or if you uh, give it a little bit of a squeeze, you'll get a couple of drops out. I wish I squeezed these opportunities more, harder, that I was more aggressive uh, when those opportunities presented. That's what, that I, that's what I would do differently now. And, and when you ask me that question, now in my 50s, when an opportunity arrives, 
I know I've, I'm wiser now to understand its impermanence. Mm. And I'm therefore far more aggressive now that when, when it arrives, just I'm there, I, take, I don't wait for it to start sailing off before I, I wake up. I take advantage of that now. I squeeze that now. Mm. That's what I would do differently then. So meaning you would, there's a, there's a revivalist uh, by the name of Leonard Revenue. He has a quote that says, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of that opportunity. Yes. Wow, that's powerful. Isn't it? Yeah. So I, I love that quote because yeah. it's a constant reminder, you know, and I feel like when you're saying that, I'm thinking, am I squeezing opportunities right now? Because I don't want to be 50 something and yeah. thinking I should have squeezed. Yeah. I mean, we're having this interview because there are certain things we want to avoid in our journey. That if you could tell us, okay, avoid this, if you have an opportunity, squeeze it. Yeah. Because I don't think I'll be in my 30s again. Yeah. You know. Well, you shouldn't be if you carry on living. You should carry on. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want you, you touch on something and maybe, um, you, know, you know, you talk about learn learn from you, et cetera. So, uh, you know, for me, what happens tomorrow if I, I'm uh, giving all this squeeze the opportunity, I'm giving all these pearls of wisdom, right? Mm -hmm. And you know who I am, you know what I've achieved thus far. What happens tomorrow if race call fails, if I, 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 I lose everything? Does the everything I've said get nullified, okay, because I've just failed. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a, I think a philosophical question for you to answer. Yeah. But for me, when I think about that, uh, why I ask that is because for me, very often wisdom is not necessarily from successful people. But there's a lot of wisdom from people who have not been successful, who have learned those lessons and gone through that pain but haven't come out of it. There's still lessons there as well. And so when you, in any environment, whether in an environment within inverted commas, what society believes is a successful person and somebody is not successful, I, I'm, I get more excited about w learning what happened. What was the failure? What are, there's so much wisdom there. So, and... You know, that's what I'm saying. You know, I'm saying squeeze the orange and then tomorrow I lose everything and now, okay, stop squeezing the orange, everyone. Don't, yeah. don't, don't, Should don't. I, can, I can answer you. Yeah. I, I don't think it nullifies the advice because in how I see it is that there are people who would have taken what you said and actually used it and it worked. Mm. And by the same token, there might be a few who took the advice and it didn't work. And in that case, it has nothing to do with disproving whether or not squeezing the orange works. Yeah, uh, It's the person going back to themselves and introspecting. If it worked for 100%. that person, why didn't it work for me? Okay. There, must, there must be something I need to do differently. Correct. Uh, perhaps, you know, one guy said, said to me in an interview, he said, someone who becomes a millionaire in the exact same thing that you do, know something that you don't know or is doing something that you're not yet doing. Correct. So introspection says, what is Alon doing that, yeah, yeah. that I'm not doing? Mm. I mean, we're in the same industry, mm. we're doing the same work. Perhaps, perhaps sometimes I could be failing and I've got the money and I haven't really realized that I don't have the support team around me yet. Because at the time you failed, when you, were, when you had the money, you probably thought, maybe I'm not that smart. Mm. Mm. And the actual answer was maybe you don't have a team. Yeah. So it. I think that introspection part plays a key role, uh, in, in my opinion, based yeah. on what you've been explaining. Yeah. Right. Um, and then when somebody has reached the point where the business is becoming successful, right? Because we always have advice for people that are failing. But I feel like sometimes even people that are succeeding, do need some advice. Mm. What advice would you have to a young person that's succeeding? Sure. That, that you know, we go through, through stages and what worked for you in stage one won't work for you in stage two, won't work for you in stage three. 
And and the mistake is that we we don't recognize that we think that what made us successful in the past is going to continue making us successful. So I think the advice there is if you're succeeding, it should make you very uh, afraid because the first thing that happens when you start succeeding is that the seed of complacency comes in. Um, the, the foot of the pedal, the loss of um, the, the, the hunger, the um, I know how this all works, the arrogance, that all, the, the seeds of that at the begin, are always in success. So to me, you know, the, the, I, 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 you will never ever hear me call myself successful. I'm succeeding. I'm relatively successful to myself five years ago. I'm relatively successful to some people I know, but I don't believe I'm successful because I have not achieved the picture in my head and I never will because the moment I come close to it, I change the picture. Make it a bigger picture. So. So the advice is, you're in danger. If you're succeeding, you're in danger. You're in danger of losing it. Every single statistic shows it. Every stat shows that it's so rare to make a lot of money, and it's more rare to keep it. And and when you go to the point of generationally, that's even more rare. That it, that it will not survive three generations. Okay. So few people can get to a point where they can build a legacy, a financial legacy. Very few people, tiny percentage. And few of those can make that legacy last more than three, two generations. Mm. Yeah, How do you start. think those who have done it have, 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 have been able to crack? I mm. mean, I don't know if, it's, if there's a code or a formula, but... I, I don't know if there is, but I would say it's got to be the value set that you embed on your kids. It's like if they grow up with that that DNA of va- the same values, yeah, they're far more likely. Uh, values and knowledge, relationship with money, relationship with people, re- understanding of business, understanding long term, that the, f- the the fact that things are not short term, there's long term as well. If you get that into your kids. And they are much, they, they, it's embedded in them culturally, then they should theoretically embed that in their children. Culturally, are you Jewish? I'm Jewish. You are Jewish? Okay, okay. I, I picked that up. Also, uh, I was interviewing someone uh, who's Jewish as well. Yeah. And and his story is quite similar to yours in the sense that he was also groomed to run the business. And he eventually didn't. Uh, he did something else. So, and then you said something that must be embedded in them culturally. So, which begs the question then, right? In your upbringing, are the things that you actually used in your business that you've learned when you were being groomed to run the family business? Meaning, what you were being groomed for was the family business, but you eventually did something else. And did the grooming then help you in your journey? 1,000%. 1,000%. I still reference uh, from working in a factory. I understand process. I understand, you know, how one thing moves from one machine to the next. I understand. And I use that in, in everything I do. Uh-huh. So are there any, like, five five lessons that you you've learned from that training we'll call it training that you still apply today yeah doesn't have to be five it can be one (laughs) it doesn't matter how smart you are i think you you work you have to work number two is people and relationships is is critical number three if you can't sell don't get into business if you really if you can't sell I will never back an entrepreneur can't sell. Number four, think long-term from an integrity point of view. The world is small. You're here because of network. And when I do a deal, I will find and find out, is is there a good, I call it GBU, good, bad, ugly. Good, bad, ugly. Are they good people, bad people? Did you call before we did this interview? A hundred percent. I check check everyone out. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so you came back as a G, you know? Yeah. 
<laughs> so um, yeah. So and and I think the the last thing is is if if you aren't also trying to enjoy it, you you have to try and enjoy it. And it's very hard in the beginning to when you're not doing well to enjoy it. You're gonna have to try and enjoy it. And so you sort of get a little bit of muscle tone. So when you start doing well, that you can enjoy it. I see too many people who then become so-called successful that they don't enjoy it. They're mm. just in it. And my personal journey is that now I'm trying to enjoy it. I am, I am enjoying it more and more and more. I enjoy what I do more and more and more. Does it get better with age? It does. For sure. Is it because the finances are growing or because you're doing more? It's because I, I'm more powerful in every minute that I can get more done out of every minute because I understand better. I understand nuance. Yo, please say that again. I, it, you know, I can, you know that, that there's the old joke about the guy, the woman who calls a, is a squeaky floor mm -hmm. and uh, she calls the guy to fix the floor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And he walks in and he walks across and he walks around the thing and he takes one nail and he hits the nail in one place and he pulls out uh, his invoice and the invoice is a hundred dollars. And she goes a hundred dollars for, for, for one nail. So he goes, no, ma'am, it's uh, actually, it's $1 for the nail and $99 for knowing where to put the nail. Yeah. yeah. So that is there when I, when I work now, because of the experience, I will short circuit a lot of things that took me years to understand is where to put that nail now, mm -hmm. metaphorically speaking. Well, any words that you actually, before I, 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 I ask you to do that, what do you think the future of South Africa is? I'm super excited. I, everyone's uh, pretty negative. I see massive opportunity here. Massive, massive. I, I, and yeah, and so, yeah, I'm investing. I see huge um, talent here. I see huge opportunity. And you know what, uh, um, I think it was Buffett that said, you know, when everyone is uh, greedy, you know, yeah, don't brave. invest when they are greedy, when they invest brave. when they are faithful. And when, when they become brave and when they, uh, or they're brave, you know, become greedy. Or well, I don't know, or, or, you know what to say. And right now, everyone's quite negative. I see so much opportunity. So much. So you think, you're saying it's ripe for investment? Ripe. And you're in the property game? Yeah. That's the game. That's the game. That's the game. Right. Thank you guys for watching uh, my interview with Alan Reyes, uh, the CEO of Reyes Corp. If you haven't subscribed, please click on the subscribe button and the notifications bell. Comment, let us know which part of the conversation you resonate with, Mr. Reyes. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming through. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Cheers. Ciao. Right. Yeah, that was nice.